before we begin, I would like to start with our uh, land acknowledgement statement. Um, so to truthfully acknowledge our site's history and present experiences, it is important to recognize the beginnings of this place. So we take this moment to acknowledge that the history of our site does not start with Europeans. The town of Ridgefield exists on the ancestral homeland Ranapo, Munsi Lenape, and Wishkwaisgek people. They were the original stewards of this land on which the Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center stands today. We thank them for their strength and their resilience in stewarding this land, and we hope to continue their legacy of protecting this site and its history. And now I would like to introduce our special guest tonight, uh, Jeannie Abrams. Uh, Jeannie Abrams received her PhD in American history with a specialization in archival management from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and has been a member of the faculty of the University of Denver since 1983. Uh, she has also served as a longtime curator of the Beck Archive Rocky Mountain Jewish History, part of special collections at the University of Denver Libraries. And she is well known locally as well as nationally for her expert expertise in medical um, early American and American Jewish history. Uh, Dr. Abrams is the author of six books, including Jewish Women Pioneering the Frontier Trail, A History of the American West. Uh, the book we'll be talking about tonight, Revolutionary Medicine, America's Founding Mothers and Fathers in Sickness and in Health. And her latest book, A View from Abroad, the story of John and Abigail Adams in Europe was published in February of 2021. Uh, she's also the author of numerous articles in both popular journals and magazines. And her op-eds have appeared in the Washington Post, History Network News and Time. So welcome Jeannie, we're really excited to have you here um, and to talk about medicine in the 18th century and all the different foods and how food relates to medicine as well. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you. For you, it's this evening. For me, it's still late <laughs> afternoon, I'm in Denver. So <laughs> I wanted to just give you a little overview um, about medicine in the time of the founders and around the revolution. And I always start out by um, pointing out that they were missing what we call the three A's, antibiotics, antiseptics, um, and I just lost my third word. Mary, jump in. What was the third one? <laughs> antibiotics, antiseptics. I'll, I'll think of it in a second. Anyway, they, they worked around that by um, trying to use herbs and um, really food items, things that we would grow commonly in gardens to actually try to treat um, people. And I don't know if I sound nasal to you, but I have a very bad cold. And I was looking through some of the things they did last night. And I noticed that Martha Washington, when um, George came down with a bad sore throat um, at the military camp at Morristown during the American Revolution, she served him a concoction of molasses and onions. So I'm thinking of trying that tonight. I don't know how she, what, how she put it together exactly, but um, it tells you that they really had an, uh, their fingers on some things that were possible. Um, and there were really, I would say, maybe four effective medications at the time. Um, one was derived from plants. One was opium from poppies, and they generally used it in liquid form called laudanum. Um, it was considered by some doctors the greatest tool in their medical tool bag or box. Um, it was used for um, basically for either uh, anxiety, but more likely for sleep and stomach ailments to calm them down. And it was something that was used by Abigail Adams, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, particularly in their later years. Um, Abigail suffered from insomnia, um, Jefferson suffered from stomach ailments, um, et cetera. So um, the laudanum was made from concentrated poppy juice mixed with alcohol and often mixed with brandy. Oh, and it was also, I should point out when I saw, oh, uh, uh, anesthetics was the other one. So um, what, it, it worked as an anesthetic too. Obviously, if you were having some opium mixed with brandy um, and whiskey, 
um, it, it would have had at least a soporific effect. And it also reminds me too that when Abigail Adams's daughter, Nabby Abigail Jr. was diagnosed with breast cancer in her, she was in her mid to late forties. Um, she underwent a mastectomy, unfortunately it was too late and the cancer spread through her body and she um, died at a young age. But the only thing that she had during the surgery was laudanum. Can you imagine um, major oh surgery with, you know, taking like a really a couple of shots of whiskey. So, but it was something they could, you know, deal with in terms of um, plants. It was used to ease pain and help people sleep. Um, another common plant used of uh, a kind of drug treatment was um, digitalis derived from the foxglove plant. And that was used successfully to treat heart um, patients for congestion, what we would call heart congestion, what they called dropsy at the time. So I'm sure if you've ever read any old uh, English novels, you will see people being affected with dropsy and basically it is a, a heart disease. Um, one that we use today, and we don't get it the same way because it's probably largely um, derived from chemicals today, but aspirin derived from the bark of the willow, which again was a, a, a painkiller and helped um, treat certain conditions, um, what we might call arthritis, they would have called rheumatism. And probably the most popular one at the time was derived from um, the bark of the Peruvian bark tree and that was also kind of boiled down and made into a concoction. It contains quinine. So that was used fairly successfully for malaria, which was rampant, particularly in the South. And many people suffered from, um, uh, you know, repeated malaria attacks, Washington and Madison, among others. Um, it was one of George Washington's favorite medicines and Franklin called it the famous cure <coughs> specific to intermittent fevers and agues. So um, something we use today. Um, I'm gonna ask you to stop and maybe see if anyone has a question so I can take a drink. <coughs> oh no. You are an absolute trooper. Well, we'll hope we'll get through this. You will. <coughs> I think it's a great time for maybe me and Catherine to take over and talk about a little bit of where our research took us in terms of home medicine and where it came from and the rise of who was taking control of it because you had mentioned Abigail Adams taking control and it, it, it very much at the time, especially in the 18th century, medicine was specifically in the home. It's not like, you know, today when we don't feel well, we go to the doctor's office. Uh, they were usually recipes handed down from generation to generation. Um, and it would most likely not be from an apothecary. The, from the research that I was getting, it was you had an herbal garden in your backyard and you learned how to make potions and not potions, uh, tonics, excuse me, tonics uh, through these recipes. And they were found in, in domestic cookbooks I found. So it was a lot of how to be a wife, how to be a home caregiver how to cook these things. And it was interesting coming at that from a 21st century perspective. I mean, it always is when you have to reflect on these things, but. So let me jump in a minute if I can. Um, there were um, publications, books out there that people who were at least middle or upper class had access to. And one of the most famous ones was Dr. William um, Buchan's Domestic Medicine. It gave practical advice, really kind of a first aid book for treating a whole host of common ailments and diseases. And the Washingtons, Thomas Jefferson, um, uh, Abigail Adams, um, the Madisons all had access to it and referred to it and used it. And um, all you were talking about the gardens, um, Abigail Adams, Martha Washington, um, Dolly Madison all grew um, medicinal plants in their gardens. I would say 
the person who used them most and was most focused on them was, of course, Thomas Jefferson at Monticello. I think I read at one point that he had 80 or 90 different types of plants that he could call on. And it was because he believed in the healing power of nature. The first resort that doctors usually went to when treating a patient was bleeding. That was, um, you know, removing some blood, they'd open a vein. And that was part of um, the feeling that the body at the time was composed of humors, um, four different major humors. And if they were out of whack, so to speak, that's what caused illness. So they felt that bleeding or purging um, were ways of realigning the body and making it work um, as it should. So Jefferson was a very strong critic of what we would call invasive medicine. And he believed that if only nature was allowed um, to work out on its own, that most people would be healed. And of course, plants um, would be one way that he used it. He was very suspicious of doctors. He was said to have once remarked, um, anytime um, I see um, doctors talking together, I look up in the sky to see if I see any vultures um, hovering overhead. So again, he was not a fan. I, I mean, he was close with a number of doctors, but what he was really talking about was invasive medicine. So he um, grew laudanum to treat headaches, which he had many of. He probably suffered from migraine headaches. Um, other herbs that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I think in his garden, he grew marjoram for treating colds, senna, rhubarb, tansy, lavender, sage, mint, times for time for headaches, upset stomachs, etc. And he was especially uh, pleased when he was stationed in Europe. He was uh, the American ambassador to France for many years before the revolution. He was there at the start of the revolution, uh, the, uh, the French revolution. And um, he had two daughters with him. Unfortunately, I, I probably should say this too. You know, obviously um, we're, we're still in COVID and we're very familiar now with being surrounded by an epidemic that um, still continues to challenge us uh, despite modern medicine, despite vaccines. But um, I don't know that until now that we all dealt with these daily illnesses and these huge amounts of death, they were surrounded on a daily basis, the American founders, by illness and death. And all of them suffered great losses. And to me, it's remarkable that they were able to accomplish as much as they did, considering the daily challenges they had. Um, Jefferson, perhaps among uh, the most severe um, his wife died, of course, when she was only in her late 20s. Um, she had given birth to, I think, at least six children, plus some stillborn children or miscarriages. Um, he lost uh, all, he, he was predeceased by all of his children except his eldest daughter, Martha. And he wrote at one point um, to a friend, um, I, I'm destined to lose everyone that's dear to me. So that's to me very poignant and sad. Um, Martha Washington probably could have rivaled Jefferson. Um, her first husband died. Um, she gave birth, uh, she became the mother with him of four children. All of her children you know, predeceased her. And she and George Washington, of course, never had any biological children together. They did adapt um, some of their grandchildren, which was not uncommon at the time because there were many orphan children. Mortality rate was very high for children in particular. And so many diseases circulating all the time. Smallpox was probably the most major um, threat at the time. And around the time of the revolution, over the five or six years, about 100,000 people died from smallpox in North America. So um, considering how small the population was comparatively to today, that was a tremendous number. And um, many of the troops during the American Revolution 
Um, yes, I see in the chat, someone said Washington started the first max, uh, mass vax campaign for smallpox. And I was just going to mention that, that Washington um, realized, I think he was very far ahead of his time in many ways. Um, he, the first order he had when he uh, became uh, the general of the army was a sanitation order because he understood there, they didn't understand germs in the way we know it today, but he did understand the efficacy of sanitation and, and promoting good health. And so he did dither about whether to inoculate the troops. Remember, it wasn't vaccination then, it was inoculation, which meant taking live smallpox matter from the arm of someone who was, or some part of the body from someone who was infected, making a cut in the um, person and then putting it into their arm in the hope that they would develop a mild case. Because if there's anything good to be said about smallpox, um, once you contracted smallpox, you were immune for life. So, but it did carry some um, risks. And about 5% um, of uh, about five percent of people who were inoculated did um, die. And so it was not entirely without risk. And with inoculation, one was contagious for a number of weeks. And if the people were not isolated, um, Washington did have quarantine hospitals set up, then, um, then it could be spread. So there was some danger to that. And I see again in the chat, maybe we'll talk about it in the questions later. Yes, um, Cotton Mather and um, Thomas Boylston in um, Massachusetts really um, earlier on had introduced um, inoculation. And, but uh, Washington, I would, say is, I would say would be the first mandatory um, inoculation because the troops were required. But um, they trusted him at the time, and it was a great risk. Still, some um, slipped through the cracks. And the reason that it was so severe among the Revolutionary War troops is because most of the um, troops were young men um, who had never been exposed to smallpox before and came from small rural areas generally. So um, uh, as uh, John Adams wrote once to George Washington and, and to Abigail, he said too, um, the smallpox has killed more um, 10 times as many people as the British have, you know, American soldiers. So it was a grave threat, um, but it was a great step forward, inoculation and then later vaccination, which Thomas Jefferson had a great hand in. Uh, actually um, was one of the most successful um, medical innovations in America and in the world. And indeed today, smallpox is the only um, major infectious disease that has been fully eradicated. Um, oh, so I got a little off track with that, but um, <laughs> hopefully um, that's okay. So um, they all, all the founders and other, you know, men and women in the colonies, um, had what they called recipe receipt books, recipe books for making medical concoctions. And um, they read, again, lots of medical tracts. Um, Thomas Jefferson had a book called Modern Practice of Physic. That's what they call med medicine, medical treatment. And he had many pharmacopias in his library. And he really became an expert on the use of um, medicinal uh, plants and, and using them to help treat people. And I started to say before, he was very skeptical of invasive medicine. When he was in France, um, his two, I, that's how I got off on that tangent because I was talking to you about, he, he had two living children then and um, they were both in France with him. The, the second one, the younger one came later. And um, they both contracted probably typhus, we can't really be sure but he was enamored at the treatment that they received from a Dr. Jem, who was an English doctor living in Paris at the time. And he treated them with Madeira wine and um, a Farinas, he said a Farinas um, uh, food, which I'm taking to mean oatmeal, but I, I can't tell you that for sure. And the basic, what basically they were doing is giving the girls supportive care and nutrition and letting the body heal itself because there was no medication. 
and he and Jefferson claimed that he used that many, many times um, afterward, that treatment for fevers on his family. And when he says family, it doesn't mean only his biological family. It's he calls his enslaved people a part of his family as well. Um, so this isn't new. It goes back even before uh, the United States is formed, of course. And Washington, as early as 1759, ordered drugs from London, including herbal tonics like spirits of lavender and cinnamon water. And this is my favorite, um, Turlington's Balsam of Life. So um, these patent medicines were probably like snake doctor medicines, but um, it, 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 it may have had a placebo effect but he believed in the, the usage. And many of these things may have worked um, like that. Um, Martha Washington, um, her first husband, we have uh, notes um, also ordered from an apothecary locally, cordials, rhubarb, uses the laxative and laudanum. And um, Martha, beside that concoction of onions and molasses that she gave to George, um, pinworm was very common in children in the South at the time, and she had what there was called the famous cure for pinworms um, that included whiskey, worm seed, rhubarb, and garlic. Um, whether it has any medical efficacy or not, I can't tell you, but they believed in it, and apparently she passed it along to all her relatives. She had a lot of nieces and nephews and, and friends. A lot of these remedies when I hear about these tonics always sound like a very terrible hangover cure that have been passed down from like college. Right. And well, I'm just like, I can't a lot of them um, include some alcohol. So I'm not sure if they made people feel better or they didn't realize how they were feeling because they had <laughs> a lot of alcohol in their body. So hard to say. Um, another very interesting founder in healthcare. Um, yes, I know. I see someone saying Sally Hemings children were really his family. So partly, as I said, partly biological, but a lot of them um, that he considered his family were not biological children. Um, Benjamin Franklin um, had a lot of interesting things to say about health. And he was a great believer in um, the efficacy of fresh air um, he notoriously took um, what he called daily air baths, um, sat in the nude every day so that the air could circulate around him, always had the windows open. There's a very humorous and famous story of when John Adams and Franklin traveled together. Um, I think they were going to the Continental Congress at the time from New York, and they shared a, a room in an inn. And, um, Jefferson opened the, excuse me, Franklin opened the window. Um, John Adams, who was quite healthy and lived the longest of all those early um, founders, uh, was a terrific hypochondriac. We might get into that later. And he got up and shut the windows. And sort of like a, a couple that have different thermostats internally all night, it was open the window, close the window. And Jefferson, uh, Adams said finally, um, he kept getting a lecture from Franklin about the efficacy of fresh air and this harangue, and he said he got so tired he finally fell asleep with the window open. So um, fresh air was um, very important to him, um, and we all know about early to bed, early to rise. He understood the importance of rest, good nutrition. Um, he saw uh, he was a great supporter of the use of lemons, particularly for sailors um, to counteract scurvy, which was um, kind of another effective food that actually did work, a, a citrus um, fruit. And um, he also, though, and I'm sure most people know this, but not only did he um, invent bifocal glasses, which many of us benefit from today, and he did that by cutting two pieces of glass, a top and bottom, fitting them together. And he wrote his sister, he said, this way I could be reading and then I could look at the prospects that means, you know, in the distance as well. And we have, I, I should have brought a slide for that, but we have a sketch of the glasses that he performed, that he um, invented. He also um, invented a um, urinary catheter, um, which was helpful. 
Um, his experiments, we all know about his uh, experiments with electricity, but I don't know if everyone is familiar that he also tried using it to treat Parkinson's disease. He had a few minor successes, but you know, not long term, but it was an interesting idea because we know that um, uh, sometimes electrical impulses to the brain are used in treatments even today under certain controlled uh, conditions. Um, he also understood the um, power of exercise and he understood he had a basic um, idea about calorie burning and that, um, that you burn more calories um, going up and down the stairs than walking on a straight um, path. Riding a horse gave you less um, calories than running um, along. And he really encouraged um, exercise. I know we kind of have the picture we usually see of Franklin as kind of an older, uh, uh, what shall I say? I would say he was corpulent, but like a round face and heavy. But he was about 5'11". And as a young uh, man in, until his late age, he was um, thin and very muscular when he was in London. He entertained people by diving into the Thames River. Um, he was a great um, swimmer and um, he really believed in that. He also suffered from gout and he didn't always listen to his medical advice. He knew certain foods not only could help cure people, they could also make them sick. And too much rich wine and red meat, which he um, ate, I'm sure in great quantities in France, he was very sociable and was out to dine out almost every night, attended salons, so that um, certainly, and he, he went to doctors. Now, this always puzzles me, but Franklin also believed in bleeding. A person who I consider so intelligent and so ahead of his time in many ways, but I do think bleeding did have a placebo effect. And as one um, historian said to me, well, they liked it because bleeding did what it was supposed to be. You were bled and it, you were bleeding. So there was a, a result, a very visible result that one could see immediately. He claimed it, it cured headaches and colds and everything else. Um, and he did have some um, ludicrous uh, ideas as well. He um, mentioned to, I think one of his sisters had breast cancer, he um, mentioned two possible cures. He um, believed that um, pokeweed could be used to cure cancer, it can't. And he also um, suggested to her that he had heard good um, uh, prospects about using a wood cone placed over the breast to help cure the cancer. So um, you have some competing forward-looking ideas with some that today we would complete, uh, you know, consider completely ludicrous. But um, in some cases, even today, they are using leeches for some medical procedures um, uh, to, to help with metabolism and diabetes and things like that. So um, even those that sound very odd to us in some ways could be. So we're not talking about plants, but we're talking about an animal, a leech that could, that could help. Um, also, um, again, Abigail Adams was um, quite astute, one, really to me, one of the most amazing women who um, lived in the American colonies or maybe even in the world. And she subscribed to certain um, ideas that she had gotten passed down from friends and family. First of all, I was very impressed during a very severe dysentery um, outbreak while um, John was in uh, the Continental Congress um, in her neighborhood. Her mother died and one of her servants died. But what she did was wash down all the walls of the house with hot vinegar. So again, no antiseptic the way we know it, but knew enough that vinegar was astringent enough to help maybe um, to take care of some of the contagion, even though they didn't understand germs per se. Although um, Franklin actually had kind of a protean idea of what he, little animals, tiny animals that caused these diseases. So uh, an idea of what would become you know, germ theory. So Abigail had a lot of home remedies. One of my favorites is, I've never tried it, but the application of boiled cabbage leaves um, for the aches and pains of rheumatism. Um, rheumatism was a catch-all for a tremendous amount of aches and pains, arthritis, et cetera. 
And um, she also uh, gave advice to nieces, new nursing mothers, um, recommending a red poultice, like red um, boiled also um, in hot water um, and soaked in hot water to relieve um, bath, uh, excuse me, to relieve uh, breast inflammations and a bath of hot herbs or chamomile flower flowers to um, make these postpartum women more comfortable. Um, she regularly on her shopping list, so to speak, uh, speak of medicines and herbs, ordered rhubarb root, nutmeg, cloves, and cinnamon, which she used um, as medicinal aids and, and simples and cordials. And during the American Revolution, um, she did write to John too to say that they found tea to be very effective to soothe people who were ill. And the boycott on tea, of course, um, she, she wrote at one point, oh, I long for having a little tea now. So um, a lot of those simples could, were probably boiled and um, transformed into different kinds of tea. She also took the bark, as they called it, which could take quinine for fevers. I don't know that it necessarily helps fevers, but again, malaria was very rampant here and in Europe, when John Adams was um, uh, stationed in Europe, when he was in the Netherlands, he had a near fatal bout with what was probably malaria. And um, he wrote to Abigail that he was so ill that he was um, unconscious for days and that he slowly recovered. Um, but John uh, always tended to, um, I wouldn't say exaggerate, that one sounds pretty um, serious, but every time he had a cold, he would write her and say, it's the worst cold I've ever had, I'm so sick, um, I can't uh, you know, manage anything. But um, as I said, he lived into his 90s, and I've often found um, Madison was in his 80s too, and he complained from youth about all his illnesses, so to, sometimes hypochondriacs um, uh, really last the longest, and um, uh, Adams, John Adams was the oldest at, I think, 90. So I'm going to um, give a little break maybe um, to stop, and we can go on later, but perhaps um, we could look at some of the questions in the chat that you could throw at me, because I see there are 40 of them. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we've had a really good chat tonight. Everybody's been very interested, and I love a good tavern tastings. It's been so interesting to listen to you. I highly recommend Jeannie's book, uh, Revolutionary Medicine. My copy that I have right next to me is littered with post-it notes of things that I wanted to talk about and discuss and things that I learned that I'm going to take forward with me. Oh, one, um, I'm going to go back one minute before oh. we go to this. It just reminded me what I really wanted to say at the beginning too was that all of the founders understood the connection between the health of the nation and personal health. And so they all looked for ways to um, buoy that. So John Adams signed the Siemens Act, which eventually um, uh, became a national hospital system um, that we have today. And Thomas Jefferson was a major supporter of Jenner's um, vaccination for smallpox, which was safer, more effective, and we can talk about that later. George Washington, as we said, uh, probably the most important decision he made during the Revolutionary War was to um, inoculate the, the troops. And Madison, um, under his administration, the first um, Pure Drug Act was passed. So we're talking about people who really understood that the commerce um, uh, of a country um, really was closely connected in its political success with a healthy nation. So they worked really to go forward. And we didn't even talk about this yet, and we may uh, down the road, but um, yellow fever was another huge threat. And in the 1793 um, yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, um, decimated the population. I think there were 5,000 deaths out of a population of 40,000. The founders were there. Most of them fled. Anybody who could um, did. Alexander Hamilton actually contracted, uh, a, uh, I would say, a pretty mild to moderate case, but Jefferson um, was housed himself at the um, outskirts of Philadelphia. Washington eventually left and they 
had kind of, once they came back, they, they moved into Germantown to have a kind of a parallel government area because Philadelphia was the, the temporary capital at the time. But um, no one knew exactly what caused yellow fever. And there was a major debate. Um, and one of the most popular offered was that it came from rotting coffee down at the wharf. So nobody connected um, the fact that that summer of 1793 was extremely humid and hot. There was a tremendous outbreak of, of um, mosquitoes and that it ended at the end when the rains came and it cooled down and um, no one at the time connected the mosquitoes who were carrying um, the, malaria, the, the yellow fever from person to person. Um, so they tried everything. Some of the um, doctors that Jefferson liked um, treated people really with supportive care only. Others like Dr. Um, Benjamin Rush, probably the leading physician in the colonies at that time, and then uh, the, the protein United States, um, treated them mostly by bleeding, sometimes um, taking a major part of their um, blood. Um, and, and many people were probably hurried to their death because of that bleeding. And that reminds me too that George Washington, the treatment for his final illness, which was probably a form of strep throat, was treated with, um, with bleeding four or five times uh, he was bled. So he probably really died of um, a, a shock, really toxic shock. Um, rather than the, the throat infection, what today we would uh, treat easily with um, an antibiotic. Okay, now go back to the <laughs> questions. I'm sorry, but I just remember. No, it's fascinating, especially when you studied Washington's death and you know Martha Washington was not a fan of bloodletting. Uh, I saw some questions come in. Uh, do we want to talk about the role that indigenous peoples played in colonial remedies, because there are quite a few, as I was going through some of those recipe books and advertisements, they all kind of link back to acknowledging that the people that were here originally knew how to <laughs> use the land, knew how to make these tonics and knew how to take care of themselves in these illnesses. Um, even going back to some of the first colonial explorers who understood the wealth of all of these plants that they were finding, especially the Spaniards, Catherine in the South and those colonies and their influence and how they became these primary uh, remedies, tools, yeah. ingredients, yes. things. Yeah, um, the Spanish empire I found in my reading really kind of became, ended up with a monopoly on the medical trade in medicines um, throughout Europe and even you know Asia um, as well because a lot of these medicines that were effective came from Spanish colonies. Um, I found like Peruvian bark, um, Ipecac, things like that, that lasting because they actually, they did what they're supposed to do in terms of remedying um, illness uh, happened to come from Spanish colonies. And so the Spanish ended up really dominating this medical trade. But the other thing I found, another reason why these particular uh, remedies seemed to be so popular was their connection to indigenous, um, exotic indigenous uh, peoples. And that's kind of how they work their way into European culture. That's what I've, I've found in some of my readings, um, which I thought was very interesting, you know, this idea of these people are, you know, at least back in the 18th century, they're a little, they're primitive, but they're natural, I guess, is um, what the thinking was back then, uh, that they ended up becoming so popular, these, these remedies. Oh, well, I should interject there that Cotton Mather learned about inoculation from his black slave because it had been practiced in China and Africa long before it was here um, in America. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's an interesting point too. And I also wanted to make the point that um, the explorers um, 
introduced so many European illnesses here that the Native Americans had never encountered and decimated smallpox, measles, decimated uh, the Native American um, populations and they had not seen that before. So they didn't have any effective, you know, treatments for that. Not that there were, you know, many um, and, and even in uh, Europe at the time um, there were not, but um, there was kind of a reciprocal, I think the pokeweed came from um, uh, Native American medicine, but I, it was not effective. So, um, you know, I'm sure there, there were some things that worked great and some that did not. Yeah, I was trying to find my list. Boniset was used uh, amongst indigenous tribes that was prescribed for fevers that were caused by malaria, typhoid, influenza, kind of like it seems like an all around Tylenol yeah. fever reducer kind of a situation. And also the influence of tobacco and how that was used originally for medicinal purposes to help with headaches, nausea, uh, increased uh, energy, but lowering your appetite. So kind of the symptoms that we see today amongst smokers, uh, were used for different purposes in the 18th century, which I, I find fascinating because I don't know. I never, I, I, again, modern contemporary person never connects tobacco as being healthy or used for like remedies. Uh, it always takes you, but there's always one thing that always takes you by surprise that you go, huh, Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of tobacco, I did notice a, a, a question about um, cannabis and hemp. Yes, um, which, I and know, was, which I know almost nothing about. I think yeah. I was, gonna say, I, I was hoping you might know something. Yeah. I, I did not know. run across anything. You know, as yeah. I said, you know, we know they use derivative of opium, but I, I'm not familiar. Um, if they did, I wonder if it's similar to Native Americans using, um, I don't know how it's pronounced, but P-E-Y-O-T-E, peyote? Oh, peyote. Peyote. Possibly. That may be another tavern yeah. tastings for us to look into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I do know. I mean, I know hemp was grown widely for rope. Right. Um, but I don't know, you know. Yes, I, I mean, I certainly medicine. didn't run across anything in my research on the founders that suggested yeah. that. Yeah, um, neither I did I. So that's another something we'll all have to kind of look into a little bit. Um, I did want to mention because uh, Jeannie, you talked about Wa George Washington ordering Turlington's um, balsam of life. And I did want to show everybody because I always like to uh, dive into the archives here at Keeler. Um, and we do actually have in our archives a advertisement of Turlington's from the 1750s. Um, so I did want to share that with everyone. Um, always a treat from Keeler Tavern. <laughs> uh, so let me open this up. Um, so let's see. Well, I think I've got a something not working. Um, that happens. I saw it for a brief moment. So um, <laughs> I saw that it was a kind of a catch all treatment for anything that ails one, including yeah. the spitting of blood, which would have <laughs> maybe indicated. Um, yeah. Uh, consumption or tuberculosis. So I, I pulled it up. I think everybody can see it now. Um, yes. This is just a part of it. It's a full kind of page, almost like a eight and a half by 11, a little different, but about that size. Um, but yeah, Turlington's uh, Balsam of Life, it's patented by virtue of the King's patent. Um, it claims to cure aches, Agues, bruises, decay of nature, uh, gravel, numbness, rising in the throat, like just about everything. Everything, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, but gravel I, would have been um, kidney stones. Yeah, yeah. And I did um, do some further research and uh, Turlington actually, he had the patent, but that never stopped people from making you know, knockoff balsam of life. 
And so he tried to control that by creating these very distinctive medicine bottles and he changed them up like every two years. Um, so you had to know like what was the official and he drew out what the, the official medicine bottle looked like. Um, but Turlington did lose the patent in like the, the 1760s or, or 70s, right after he, he died. Um, so I did find there were tons of receipts, recipes to make Turlington's uh, after that. So this one um, here is from The Art of Cookery, uh, which was one of the most popular, you know, published recipe books at the time, um, which I think is uh, really interesting. You can see there's like myrrh and frankincense, um, angelica flowers, and a lot of what we would consider aromatic spices um, as well. So I don't know if it did anything, like you said, probably just a SIBO effect, right? Which, which is not inconsiderable sometimes, right? It yeah. helps a little. Um, and also, this is not um, a plant or a vegetable, but um, I a lot of emphasis was put on baths and going to kind of spa type um, areas. So both Washington and um, Jefferson um, went in Virginia to um, take the waters um, in the hope of curing what was bothering them. For um, Washington, after the war, he really um, suffered, uh, I mean, for his early war experiences as a soldier, that is the general of the uh, American army. And he went there in the hopes of feeling better. Um, Jefferson um, had a, a severe rash, he tried that. Um, if anyone gets a chance to look at my new book, um, uh, a View from Abroad, the story of John and Abigail Adams in Europe. Um, she was sent to Bath, the city of Bath, um, to take the cure for a variety of illnesses, um, for stomach upsets, for rheumatism. Um, and she enjoyed the social life to some extent, although um, if you read the book, you'll see she was very critical about many things in Europe. Nothing for her could match um, America. And at one point, she even uh, wrote her sister and said, even the birds sing more sweetly in America. But then she wrote, but don't tell anyone I say that or they'll say that I'm, I'm not being uh, fair to the Europeans. <laughs> but um, she did feel uh, that it helped her going to the bath. She was also exposed to swimming for the first time, or at least uh, dipping into the water. I doubt that she swam. But um, in England, they had um, swimming areas for women where you would go you were supplied with a bathing costume. That meant being dressed from head to toe um, in a bathing costume instead of uh, you know, a kind of a modern bathing suit. But um, she thought it was delightful and, and also you know, would help your health stimulate your heart, et cetera, et cetera. So again, not plants, but um, using nature. Yeah, there's definitely, from what I was understanding, once you got diagnosed, especially when you talk about mineral water and the springs and, and dipping your toes into the water, it really was a regime. Like the doctor would tell you that you'd have to wake up and in the morning you'd have to have this, this tonic or this kind of cure-all. You would have to wash your face a couple of times. You'd be on a strict diet of you can't eat this, but you have to eat this food at this many times a day. And it would last several months. I mean, I saw some that were like, you know, do this for three and a half to four months, and then come back to me if you're not cured of taking baths. And I saw one of the, I don't remember which one it was. I looked at so many, but one of them was taking a bath for no longer than three minutes, covering your hair. So it didn't get wet. And then doing that three times a day for like two and a half months. And then that is in conjunction with having a tonic of some sort, and then having bark to cure the nausea that was supposed to cause something else. And I felt so thankful for Advil in that moment. Um, so, so thankful for the little things. Um, but there were definitely, uh, me and Catherine were talking about this earlier, definitely ingredients and foods that were mentioned in the 18th century in these papers and in the Keeler Tavern ones in the 19th century that we still use today. And I, somebody had mentioned elderberry as well and kind of the rise of uh, more, uh, natural path, considering, you know, modern medicine and taking those, uh, those into account. I know my, you had mentioned vinegar earlier, my grandmother, uh, 
cleaned the house that I grew up in with vinegar. So that smell is always kind of, if I smell that, I, sm I can literally see my grandmother cleaning with that. Uh, so my scent memory kicks in for those kinds of things. So it's definitely interesting to see what has stuck with us and what has stopped. Luckily, we have uh, let go of bloodletting. Uh, but to see what has continued on into the 21st century has been very interesting and in the trends that we do. Ginger, great for motion sickness. Yeah, see, these are things that we can still use. Maya said frankincense is a powerful anti-inflammatory. Um, ginger for motion sickness. I only clean with vinegar, right? Yeah, see, there's things that stick with us. Uh, yeah, we, I use vinegar, um, for collection safe cleaning around the museum, yeah. um, too. So yeah, it, I mean, it works. Um, so yeah, there's definitely certain things that, that work and continue to work and they, we, we've, we keep up with them, um, and they last for a reason, you know, um, I like the window open when I sleep. Yeah. Franklin was onto something with that one. Yeah. The thing I found fascinating about Benjamin Franklin is kind of his role as America's science communicator. Um, I did realize, you know, recently with all of, you know, the COVID going on, science communication has been such a big thing. And it really is an art form of, you know, Yes, and I mean, he, he, you know, he was the printer and a publisher for a number of successful newspapers and his almanac and all there were always health tips. There was one I remember in the almanac, which was tips for a long life. And it talked about getting proper sleep, proper nutrition, um, et cetera, et cetera. Things that we agree today um, certainly play an important part in health and uh, Jefferson pushed that too. Um, he was an early riser and he once uh, told one of his grandchildren, uh, the sun uh, never caught him, um, you know, a bed. He was always up before the sun, but he always went to sleep early. Uh, Jeff, uh, Adams too, um, most of the time when they were in France, he made sure that he was asleep by 10 o'clock. And um, they, and they did, um, as a matter of fact, Abigail, um, when they were in Paris, the Adamses rented a huge mansion. It was a little dilapidated, but it was a 40 room mansion. And um, they rented it in part because she told her sister that um, John's health really demanded that they would be out of the, the bad um, miasmas of the city mm -hmm. and that um, they needed the fresh air of the countryside. So um, they certainly had an appreciation um, for you know, health and nature, all of them on, on different levels. They really all did kind of build off of each other in terms of what you ate and how you took care of yourself and the foods that were prescribed to you as these remedies and how much they overlap and intersect with each other of, and also how they thought that medicine and food and things like stress and fresh air and, and all of that kind of exterior things that we don't, I think, think about today play into each other. Um, it was interesting to see how you, when you talk about the humors of science, the four humors and the phlegm and the black phlegm and the foods that you were supposed to take to fix this, but you couldn't take this, but you should take this. And it, I, they weren't, they were wrong in like the, med, the medicine sense of it, but the overall aspect of taking care of yourself in these which ways and like Abigail Adams, like putting vinegar in her house to know that it cleaned. And I think there was, there was another thing that you had mentioned in your book, they had burned the letters, not fully burned the papers, but to burn oh, them oh, when they came was, in. That um, was to try to mitigate. Um, Adams was, you know, John was quite ahead of uh, his time too. And he was one of the first to actually um, get a smallpox inoculation. Uh, as I told you before, smallpox was, uh, inoculation was very controversial and many cities banned it. And so John took advantage. Um, he had it, I think he was 29. Oh, and, and the, here we go, food again. Um, they actually, for a preparation, they had to have a soft diet with milk and toast yeah. soaked in milk. But they also gave people mercury, which is not a plant. Um, and it caused um, John to have his teeth loosened. Um, so they didn't understand the negative effects. 
but he was engaged to Abigail at the time. And so he, when he wrote her, he said he had the letters double smoked because the uh, smallpox actually can um, be spread um, from fomites. So it can be um, spread not just through the air, but through the surface. So he um, twice um, uh, had it twice smoked, which means that he put it by the fireplace and that they felt that might um, kill those germs that they didn't know about. George Washington contracted smallpox when he was about 19. He went to Barbados with his um, brother. His brother had TB, tuberculosis, and he went in the hope to find a cure for his brother. They stayed in a house where there was smallpox um, and he did contract smallpox. May have um, caused him to be impotent. And that may have been, or I would say infertile probably, um, infertile and uh, probably why he never had any biological children with Martha. But um, he was quite ill, but on the other hand, it did uh, prevent him from contracting smallpox you know, in the future. And, he encouraged uh, Martha to get inoculated. She was nervous about it, but she finally did as well. Abigail was a, I would say, a more feisty uh, sort. Her parents did not want her to get um, inoculated because she was um, in fragile health even when she was a child. And it was part of the reason she was homeschooled, but there were other reasons as well. And she took um, advantage of a temporary lift of the ban in Boston during the American Revolution while John was in Philadelphia. And she and all her, her four children were inoculated with all different um, uh, results. Um, one, one child it didn't take, he had to have it done again. One was terribly sick with fever and nausea and vomiting and um, really um, severely ill. And um, their daughter, Nabi, um, uh, came out with pox all over her face and her body. So um, there, you know, there were risks involved, but she realized the bigger risk of the mortality rate for smallpox is between 25 and 30 percent. That is extremely high. Again, very thankful for things like Tylenol today. Yeah. <laughs> That's that was my common thread through all of this research, although fascinating. And I went down hours of research about bloodletting and medicinal remedies and how to make uh, remedies. And I keep wanting to say potions and I know that that's wrong. Well, they, uh, sometimes they were called potions as well. Tonic. We, we think is a potion word. is a witch's brew, but um, some of those uh, medications uh, were called potions, even some of the patent medicines. We are coming up on time. It's just about 7.30. We've got one or two more minutes. Um, I would just like to personally thank Jeannie for kind of hauling through her, her sickness right now and rallying to come join us. We really, really appreciate thank it. You. I My pleasure. Saw, a reminder of what the challenges they faced were. Yeah, I saw a few people say that they were going to purchase the book. Sarah has been dropping the links in the chat for you guys. I can't highly recommend this enough. Um, it has come into, it's going, well, it's going to be part of my rotation of books that I pull from. So I am very excited to have read it and been introduced to it. So I'm so glad that all of you can join and listen to this wonderful Tavern Talks. Uh, it's always a pleasure on my end to hang out with all of you on a Tuesday night. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be with you. Bye-bye. All right. So uh, uh, yes, thank you, Jeannie. Um, and I'm glad everybody seemed to, to enjoy this talk. Um, and we had some great chat going on uh, as well. And I hope you'll join us next month uh, for our, it'll be our last Tavern Tastings of the the season um, until the fall. Uh, so next month, uh, March 8th, uh, we'll be talking about whiskey. Um, so we're going to end on a, on a, on a bang. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, hopefully we'll see you all next month. Bye. Thanks. It was lovely to meet you all. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.